This week on Ebert and Roper and the Movies... I can't believe it. What are you doing here? Uh, Sylvester Stallone meets Rocky Balboa. Clint Eastwood is one tough French cop. Je sais ce que tu penses. And Marilyn Monroe's last film comes to life. Come on in. I'm Richard Roper, columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. You can't see those scenes in a movie theater, but scenes like that and lots of other extra features are included on DVDs. We're calling the show Bells and Whistles. Oh, hey! If you don't already have a DVD machine, there may be one in your future. Their popularity has grown twice as fast as videotape decks, and they've become the fastest selling video consumer item in history. Maybe that's because the DVD picture is twice as good as tape. There are already 13 million DVD machines in use, with many models priced below $200. But the great picture and sound are not the only reason movie lovers love them. DVDs are an ideal medium for all sorts of extras for buffs. For example, the Platinum Edition DVD of David Fincher's Seven is jam-packed with bells and whistles, including this alternate opening. Is there something the matter? Oh, no. Oh. It's just... Everything is so strange. If you're a fan of Oliver Stone's JFK, the DVD features a director's cut that is 17 minutes longer than the original version, plus another 50 minutes of deleted scenes. Within minutes, false statements and press leaks about Lee Oswald circulate the globe. The official legend is created, and the media takes it from there. Christopher Guest's hilarious comedy, Best in Show, comes with an array of bells and whistles, including this alternate ending featuring dog show winners Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara, who hope to parlay their success into a series of lucrative endorsements. And, uh, we had a lot of shifty, shifty offers. We were asked to put our, our name on a pooper scooper, uh, the fleck, poopy flicker. Life is probably too short to look at all the outtakes and alternate endings from every movie ever made, but when you're really interested in a movie, it can be fascinating to take a look at some of the alternate footage. And directors like Oliver Stone even use the DVD as an opportunity to almost remake their film. Yeah, Stone is on record as saying that he thinks DVD is what's going to last and that when he's 80 years old, he may recut mm -hmm. JFK again. I don't know who will be the killer this time I around. think he's added half an hour to his DVD of uh, Nixon. Yeah, he has, exactly. And now I've got some favorites of my own. It's a real treat to see some of these characters come to life again in scenes that didn't make it into theaters. The Austin Powers DVD has several very funny scenes that didn't make the original version, including this argument over a briefcase. You're $832 short, baby. I had to buy the case. Ah, so in essence, I'm buying the case. But what if I don't like the case? It's a nice case. No, no, it's a lovely case. It's a Fendi. I like the case. You did see snippets of Tom Cruise's infomercial in Magnolia, but on the DVD, the infomercial is shown in its entirety. Learn how to make that lady friend your sex-starved servant. And check out the alternate ending they considered for Independence Day. Doesn't anyone have any missiles left? as if Independence Day had any believability to lose in the first place. But if you think of ID4 as the ultimate summer popcorn movie, the DVD with an entire second disc of bells and whistles is like a big box of junior mints to go along with the popcorn. You know, I talk to people who just devour these DVDs. They look at uh, all yeah. the different stuff and they even go searching for Easter eggs and other hidden things that are somewhere on the disc. Sure. And they really get into the movie to such a degree that you're baffled when you're trying to talk to them because they know you have to see the DVD, yeah, you too. have to see it yourself in order to know what they're but talking about. But the point about. is, as you made earlier, Roger, that you got to really like the film. If you yes. like the film, you really get into this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, the DVD of the first Superman with Christopher Reeve includes auditions by a roster of would-be Lois Lanes, including Stockard Channing, Ann Archer, Susan Blakely, Deborah Raffin, and Margot Kidder, who won the role. Well, um, just how fast do you fly? Oh, I don't know, really. You know, I've never actually tied myself. Say, what? Why don't we find out together? I'm just, how do you suggest that we do that? And Sean Penn talks about playing Spicoli in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So it, was, it was a lot of fun, you know, you worked with a lot of people your own age who were also just starting out. You know, Sean Penn's not much on doing publicity, so he must have a real fondness for that character to appear all these years later in a documentary about Fast Times. If we could only get him to play Spicoli at age 40, maybe that'll that be That could be an idea for a great movie, because Fast Times <laughs> at Ridgemont High introduced so many yes. new 
stars. Yeah. That was like uh, the American graffiti of the 80s. Of the early 80s. You can even go behind the scenes in animation, where in a way there really aren't any scenes to go behind because animation is all in two dimensions. <laughs> Look at this new collector's DVD of Fantasia. Walt Disney originally wanted a segment based on the ride of the Valkyries, but on the eve of American participation in World War II, here's what the studio decided. It was perhaps considered too Germanic a piece to be uh, inserted in any future Fantasia. And here's a different generation of animation. The Chicken Run DVD has special features showing how the famous Aardman animators created the world of Tweety's Farm. Stop motion animation is the process of placing a model in front of a camera and taking a picture. Then, moving that model and taking another picture. Repeating the process 24 times yields one full second of animation. One of the neat things about all the how they did it back safe stuff on these DVDs is that the technicians mm -hmm. who do the special effects and paint the mat drawings and animate the tabletop stuff and right. uh, make the waves and so forth get to talk about their contribution. And they work right. all the time in the shadows of yeah. the directors and the stars, and now they get to talk. Now we understand why it takes 400 people to make a movie <laughs> and why some of these movies cost $80 million. Coming up next, the answer to how did they do that on a whole lot of other movies. Neither the storm nor the boat are real in that scene from The Perfect Storm, but they sure do look like they are. Continuing this special show about bells and whistles on DVDs, this segment is about how sometimes you walk out of the theater wondering, how did they do that? The DVD shows you how they took live-action shots in a giant water tank and blended them with computer-generated special effects. You know, you see a little bit of a wave over here that has been added. And then on this other side here as well, you know, we show just doing some lightning frames, sort of like showing the monster in the background behind us. In The Patriot, it looks like there are hundreds of soldiers in some of the battle scenes, and here's how they did that. So we finally wound up essentially having to get rid of the whole battle that was being seen out the window and replace it entirely computer graphic soldiers and um, explosions that we cut from other takes. Alfred Hitchcock didn't have computers when he made the birds in 1963, but moviegoers were amazed by the way he got those birds to behave so ominously. On the DVD, there's a new documentary interviewing people who worked with him at the time. These kids, they tie the birds to the back of their collars, and they'd be flapping and carrying on, and it was quite terrifying, really. But how else could you do it? Sometimes I know people wonder if it really helps to know the secrets behind some of the great shots. And this is my theory. The first time I see a movie, I don't want to know anything. I just want to sit there. And after that, sure. then if I like the movie, I want to know everything. Yeah, exactly. When I saw The Patriot, I had no idea that they had done that. But now that I've seen the movie and enjoyed it, watching it on DVD, it just enhances my enjoyment. In the commentary track on the life and death of Colonel Blimp, Michael mm -hmm. Powell, the director, is talking to Martin Scorsese. And Scorsese says... Gee, how'd you get 150 extras in wartime? And Powell says, I think if you look carefully, Martin, you'll see that two-thirds of them are plaster of Paris. Not moving <laughs> around too much. Some movies just cry out for how'd they do it type DVD bells and whistles. For example, The Matrix. When I saw it in the movie theater, I was already thinking about that souped-up DVD version that would come out. And sure enough, it has a terrific package explaining some of the special effects. Each camera has a specific moment in time to fire a frame of film. All that is uh, taking into account the net effect, the total effect of the move. That is a camera coming up to speed, moving at a speed, and coming uh, uh, off a of speed. Time traveling in the other direction, the makers of Gladiator show how they created their vision of Rome as it was some 1,800 years ago. We can basically do anything. Given enough time and given enough money, anything is possible. And in one of my favorite tutorials, the makers of The Sixth Sense explain the rules and clues they sprinkled throughout the movie. So when he's out in public, like he's in the restaurant, you look closely when he comes up to the table and he sits down with uh, his wife, he doesn't move the chair. Sometimes bells and whistles are more than just shiny doodads. In the case of The Sixth Sense, they truly enhance the experience of rewatching a brilliantly conceived thriller. You know, that's also the case with the DVD of Fight Club, a movie that I had some problems with when it came out. But certainly there are yeah. clues and ideas in that movie that benefit from the two-disc set that they brought out on DVD. And after I watched it. all those bells and whistles on the Fight Club, then I did want to go back and watch the movie again. Mm -hmm. Coming up next, we've talked about a lot of things that are on DVDs, but there are things that only DVDs can do.
More than 50 big name stars made cameos in Robert Altman's wonderful Hollywood satire, The Player. But if you can't remember exactly when Jack Lemmon played the piano, the DVD has a handy feature called Go to My Scene. All you do is click on an actor's picture and you're there. That's an example of one of those cool extras you like to show to your friends when you're spinning through your DVD collection. Like this medley of wacky moments on the set of Armageddon. Yo, Houston, what's going on? Maybe you was the wrong choice for this mission. I am to you. Now, the X-Men DVD includes a very cool animated storyboard outlining the train station fight sequence. The six-DVD set Marilyn Monroe, The Diamond Collection, includes a disc titled Marilyn Monroe, The Final Days, which includes a fascinating documentary about Marilyn's last and unfinished movie, Something's Gotta Give, from which she was fired, partly because she left the set to sing at JFK's birthday party. Happy birthday, Mr. President. When a DVD provides a fresh look at a great star like that, it's almost as good as J.D. Salinger writing an introduction to the next printing of Catcher in the Rye. A mind-boggling concept. Another bonus that most DVDs offer is subtitles in more than one language. In fact, some of the Hong Kong action classics are subtitled in eight or nine languages. Here's another bonus. Even when the film is in English, it often has subtitles in English, which makes them great for the hearing impaired. You can even use the subtitles to settle bets. For example, people have watched Casablanca for years wondering exactly what Peter Lorre says here when he tells Bogart about the letters of transit. Letters of transit signed by General de Gaulle. Did he say they were signed by General de Gaulle? How could that be? De Gaulle was the enemy of the Nazis. Okay, let's click on the English subtitles and see what he said. Letters of transit signed by General de Gaulle. Aha, the English subtitles say de Gaulle. Okay. Let's see what the French subtitles say. Letters of transit signed by General de Gaulle. And that to me almost qualifies as an Easter egg because it's a secret thing that most people will never figure out, which is that the subtitlers couldn't agree on what Peter Lorre said. <laughs> DVDs also let you listen to the same movie in different languages. Here's Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry in English, French, or Spanish. He's one tough hombre. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? You don't do And some discs allow an easy comparison between the screenplay and final film. Here's an example from Taxi Driver. I realize now how much she is just like the others, cold and distant. Now, not everybody is going to want to do a line-by-line -line comparison of a screenplay, but it's great if you're doing a class assignment or learning how to write screenplays or studying acting, because you can see a little better what kinds of personal styles and spins the actors are adding to the words. And I love the subtitle thing, because Marlon Brando sort of famously mumbles his line like this. How would you love to have the subtitles with him? <laughs> One of the best-known bells and whistles on DVDs are the alternate audio tracks. This is where you can hear the director, the actors, the writers, or crew members describing a movie one shot at a time. For example, Tim Burton discussing his 1990 fantasy, Edward Scissorhands. I realize, too, this film could be a result of watching a lot of those k uh, ads where all these weird products growing up, looking at this, is... I didn't realize that the inspiration could be the pocket fisherman. You just have to be yourself. Even critics get in the act. I did a commentary on Dark City, the science fiction epic. What Proyas does throughout this stretch of the film is not to do a lot of tracking or panning or zooming but to cut from one static setup to another. That was hard work. It took about eight hours to record that track, although sometimes it sounds like actors just do it in real time, walking in, sitting down in front of the TV, opening up the mic, and with a case of beer right there handy. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. In fact, a classic example of that is in Boogie Nights. It's a brilliant spoof, almost, of these audio commentaries. You got audio tracks here that seem maybe a little bit sloppy, or maybe they're just really entertaining. Mark Wahlberg, for example, keeps complaining that he's got to be somewhere as his cell phone keeps ringing, and John C. Riley might be playing that drinking game himself. He seems rather lubricated as he rambles on to director Paul Thomas Anderson about Burt Reynolds. He was so much older than everyone else in the movie for, the, for most of the scenes that he was doing, except for like Bob, Ridge, Bob Ridgely and Philip uh, uh, Baker Hall. He really, he rose to the challenge, you know, he was kind of like, he didn't, he was really out of his element. 
and leave it to the members of Spinal Tap to stay in character as they provide commentary about that landmark mockumentary. Such a waste of nice flowers to put them on a dead bloke's headstone. Well, you're going to put it on a live bloke's headstone. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. I have to say, I much prefer these creative audio commentaries to the producer and director saying things like, Tom and Meg were great to work with, or we had such a hard time getting that shot. I like when they add a little more to it. Yeah, you know, sometimes there are spontaneous moments that are really touching. For example, in the commentary for Nashville, Robert Altman sees a mm -hmm. scene involving Tommy Thompson, who was his assistant director for 30 years, right. and who had died just a week before he recorded that track, and he begins to talk about Thompson. And you realize you're really in the moment with the director Absolutely. talking about a colleague. And it's not like they're doing seventh or eighth takes on that. You're getting the raw, spontaneous yes, emotion. Okay, coming up next, a very popular feature of DVDs nicknamed no, Easter eggs. I did it! It's a sign that's meant to tell you what the freeway is doing up ahead. And it seemed like a perfect metaphor for me for a sign who can tell you what's going to go on up ahead in your life. Steve Martin explains the inspiration for L.A.'s story in a feature not listed on the DVD menu for that movie. It's an example of an Easter egg, a hidden treasure that might not be listed or detailed anywhere on the DVD box or even in the press materials, but it's well worth the hunt. For example, in the DVD of the first Rocky, go to the main menu, click the up button until the Rocky logo appears. Now hit enter and you'll kick off a three-minute feature in which Sylvester Stallone meets his creation face to face. If we had to do it all over again, is there anything you'd change? Yeah, are you kidding? I would never drink them raw eggs again. What? Then show a little patience when you find the color bars in Magnolia, and they'll eventually lead you to an outtake of Tom Cruise cracking up in a scene about a dead dog. I mean, when I got to the hospital, no one would listen to me. I was saying, hey, you know, Pookie's in trouble here. <laughs> Not every DVD comes with an Easter egg, and many eggs are of the soft-boiled variety. You just get an extra TV commercial or a list of people who contributed to the DVD. I say if you're going to go to the trouble of hiding Easter eggs, make sure they're well decorated. Yeah, I don't want to go clicking around for hours only to find out who did the sound on the alternate soundtrack. Exactly. You can find dozens of Easter eggs listed on the web at DVDReview.com. Here are a few of them. The DVD of the Bedazzled remake contains a 10-minute scene featuring Brendan Fraser as a raunchy rock star. And from being John Malkovich, here's one of my favorite Easter eggs. See what it says? Now look what happens when you press it. I wonder if it's cheating to go to the web to find the Easter eggs instead of spending hours clicking all over the screen. Go to the web, save some time. You know, I do love this stuff, but sometimes the Easter egg hunt is so complicated and tedious, I just do want to go back to watching that movie. You're supposed to be able to find all kinds of hidden extras, for example, on the Independence Day DVD by highlighting the main menu entry, but then you have to press the right button arrow, then you have to enter the ship while pressing the number 7 and 4 on your remote. I kept failing in my mission, I finally just gave up <laughs> on it. Is there such a thing as too many bells and whistles? You betcha. Some of these DVDs throw in everything but the kitchen sink, and then they have the kitchen sink. For example, <laughs> the multi-disc sets for Brazil and for Terminator 2. Those are two of the landmarks of DVD production. Coming up next, we each name our favorite DVD. Now Richard and I are both going to select our personal favorite DVDs, not just for the bells and whistles, but overall. And my choice would be the DVD of The Third Man, one of the greatest films of all time. For one thing, it looks great. Look at this comparison between the picture they started with and what it looked like after they restored it. It has newsreel footage of the famous sewers where the chase scene was held. Sometimes the going is comparatively easy, though it could never be called pleasant. And it even has two different radio broadcasts with Orson Welles starring as Harry Lyme. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. A great disc 
for a great movie. My favorite DVD of the moment is the awards edition of American Beauty, which augments one of the best films of the last several years with more than three hours of bells and whistles, including an illuminating documentary, production notes, commentary from the director Sam Mendes and screenwriter Alan Ball, and even a DVD ROM feature that lets you watch the movie, read the screenplay, glance at the storyboard all at once. It's like taking a film class on your home computer. And a lot of these DVDs also have links, so if you happen to be watching them on a computer, you right. can click the link and go to a website that tells you even more. There's no end to it. That's <laughs> it for this special show. Remember, you can hear our reviews and get a list of all these DVD titles at ebert-roper-movies.com and read us in print at suntimes.com. Next week, we'll be back with a look at the summer blockbuster Pearl Harbor starring Ben Affleck. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.